his own hall, you know, Danny Gans. And he, he, will, he is the, the most uh, gifted person you've ever seen in your life. Harvey and Leslie went to one of his shows. They said it was the most amazing show they've ever been. He impersonates anyone and anybody that you could, every musician that you can think of. He can impersonate their voice. I mean, he, he does Nat Cole and Natalie Cole, both. He does the Bee Gees. He does, you know, who's that guy? Who's the guy that does the trumpet? Um, no, no, no. The, um, Louis Armstrong. Does Louis Armstrong, Frank Sinatra, just all these kind of things. And just one right after the other, he'll just do these. And in, 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 in you can't imagine the voice range. There was a producer that had produced many of the people that he does. And he said he does them better than they do themselves. In other, and he, was, he, was being, he said, in other words, when I had these people in the studio, there was times they couldn't hit their notes. They had to do it again and over and over. And he says, but every night he goes out and hits those notes that these people themselves can't even hit all the time. And, he, and the range, it's just, you, you will be mesmerized. Look on YouTube, there's a, I think there's one segment that's about 17 minutes that's kind of compact with some stuff that he does. And there's a, there's a part one and part two that's pretty cool. I think it's 14 minutes each. But it's just absolutely the most incredible thing you've ever seen. But uh, anyway, you'll be entertained by uh, seeing that. And again, this is for your entertainment, anyway. Just for your enjoyment. Praise God. All right, children and youth, you guys are released to go to your classes. You're released to go to your classes. And we are on, we're going to start here on page 34. Everybody have page 34? This is talking about, and we're down here under B, because we've been looking at what, what does a son of God act like? Okay, that's number three. But we looked at the attributes of Jesus, obviously, uh, Jesus was Son of God, but you know that Jesus himself, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and does what? Dies. This is John 12, 24. Unless a grain of wheat will fall to the earth and die, it will do what? Remain alone. However, if it does come to the earth and die, what will it do? Reproduce more fruit. Now, what, what do you think that parable is representing? It's representing Jesus himself. He's the grain of wheat that came to the earth then died. And as a result of his death, what did he do? Reproduced more of himself. And so what Jesus, we're birthed through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Jesus birthed us into the kingdom of God. Does this make sense to you? He reproduced himself. That's what we are. We become an ambassador. An ambassador is a representative of someone else. And so we become a representative of Jesus. Now what does that mean? That means real simple. Look at the word represent and just take it and change it just the way it sounds. And what we do is we represent. That's what we do. We're a representative. We represent him. So Jesus, when he was on this earth, was presented by God okay, to the people, Jesus births us, and now we represent him. In other words, we become like him. We act like him. We do what he did. We say what he said. Does this make sense? And we begin to minister to other people. Okay, so that's what we do. That's what, that's why the attributes of Jesus, fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, Jesus walked in all of those things. Okay, doing the works of the Father. I'm going down through that list, and now I'm down to B, which says, in the area of spiritual dominion. We talked about that last week. We need only to see a few things clearly to change our lives and the lives of all that we meet forever. In other words, if we want our lives to be changed and we want to be able to affect and change other people's lives, there's not, if you're already a believer, there's not a whole lot of changes. There's not major changes you have to do. Just a few things. Just a few things. Not a whole lot. Okay, now watch. If you will earnestly seek to have the truths that I'm about to share with you and graft it into your heart, you'll walk upon this earth like Jesus, okay, as God intends you to. If you just take a few of these truths, get a hold of them, get them into your heart, you'll see results and you'll see that you'll be able to do the things that Jesus did. Isn't that what Jesus said? We looked at John 12, 24, and, and we know that John... 
Where is it? 614? No. 612? Where does it say that? Jesus said, these works I do, and you shall do, and greater works than these you shall do, because I go to my Father. Where's that at? I know that scripture. The 1412? You could be right. 1412? Let's try it. We're about to try it. 1412. See if that's it. This is God's plan for us. Yeah, that's it. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. You understand that God is expecting you to do the same thing he did. That's what he, that's what he expects from you. The works I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Which meant when he went to his father, what did he do? He sent back something else. Sent the Holy Spirit to us so that we could do the same things he did. All right, so truth number one. Truth number one. This is God's intention. I know we talked about this last week. We ended with it. God intended man, this was his intention, to have and walk in dominion. God intended man to have dominion. That's all, you understand this? You already have that. Okay? So that's not something you need to get. You don't need to get dominion. You already have it. Okay? So that's not something you're trying to obtain. That's already given. It's already yours. Okay? So God intended man to have it, but to walk, are you walking in it? If you're not walking in it, it isn't because you don't have it. It's because you're not walking in it. It's because you, here, here, and here, it's because you don't believe you got it. So the first step is not to get it, because you already got that. It's to believe you got it. Believe you have it. Okay? You have that through him. Truth number two. Oh, look at John. Look at, throw it up, Mary Beth. First John chapter 4, verse 17. Let's look at, at another scripture to kind of support this intention of God. To kind of support this intention of God. Okay, 1 John 4, 17 says that love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness. Isn't that one of the things? Boldness and compassion and availability, right? That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, watch this, as he is, so, so are what? We, so are we. As he is, so are we. When we get to heaven, that's not what it says. This is, a, this is something you, the mind has to be renewed upon. As he is, so are we where? In this world. Now. Presently. See, many people are like, well, one day I'll be like God. One day when I get to heaven. Well, one of these days I'll be, you know. That's not what it says. It says that now, right? In this world, as he is, so are we. Where? In this world. In this world world okay that when you if you can get a hold of that right there that that will change your life okay now number two man forfeit mankind adam forfeited that position of dominion why what did he come into agreement with came into agreement with sin and satan right came into agreement with the enemy as a result of coming into agreement as a result of sinning what happened we call this is a doctrine called the fall of man. Man fell. When man fell. Man fell into what? Fell into sin. Fell into bondage. Okay? Fell from his position. Fell from God's glory. All have sinned and have what? Fallen short of what? God's glory. Walking in the glory of God. Okay? When we're walking in the glory of God, what are we seeing in our lives? What are, what, what are we seeing in people's lives that we come in contact with? What should, we, what should we be seeing? Signs, wonders, merit. We should be seeing those things. If we're not seeing those things, then we're not walking in His glory. Okay? We're not walking in His glory. We want to be able to see it. That's the truth. Okay? <coughs> Forfeit a position by acting on Satan's word instead of God's word. Number three. What do I say number three? When man forfeited that position of dominion, he also forfeited his position of fellowship and communion because that's where the dominion is, stems from. All your power, and we talked about it, was it last week we talked about this? Dunamis and exousia, or was it two weeks ago? I think it was last week. 
Was it last week? Okay. <clears throat> your power or your ability. Okay? If you're a believer, just like we said in, in truth number one there, if you're a believer, you already have that. You already have it. You, you're, you're, you already, you're not trying to get more power. You're not trying to get more anointing. You're not trying to get more of that. You already have that. What you're trying to do is eliminate the doubt that you have it. Begin to have the confidence that you have it. Okay? So, so you have the power. You also have the authority, which is what? Power is dunamis. That's the ability. Exousia, which is the authority, the legal right to use it. Both of those have been given to every believer. Every believer has been given the power, in other words, the ability, and every believer has been given the authority. Okay? Now, next question. Why aren't we seeing results? If we got the ability and we got the authority, why aren't believers seeing results? You know what they lack? They lack based, yeah, they lack faith. They're not using faith. They, they lack confidence. Good. What else? Initiative. Good. Knowledge, understanding. My people are destroyed because they lack. Not, they have the ability, they have the authority, but you start talking to believers and you'll realize they don't believe they have it. They just don't believe they have it. They don't believe they can do it. So therefore they don't take the initiative. Don't walk in faith. Don't have the confidence. Okay, so can you understand in these truths, you're, you're not trying to get that kind of, you already have that. All you're trying to get is your confidence in his word. Confidence in what he said. Okay, and this is a result of what? What's the foundation of all of it? Fellowship and communion, we can sum that up with relationship. It all comes through relationship. That's what it comes from. That's where it all, you plug in, the, you cannot have a problem. If you have a proper relationship with God, you'll know, your, you'll know you ab your ability. You'll know it. If you have a proper relationship with God, you'll know your authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why did Jesus walk in it? Because he had proper relationship with his Father. He was in constant fellowship and constant communion with the Father. As he was in constant fellowship and communion, he knew who he was. And he walked in a confidence. He walked in an authority. He started sharing. And, and so, you know, I was sharing before that you can, two different people, you can, you can say the same thing. You can preach the same message. Word for word even. But in one, it comes across with authority, and another person, it just comes across as words. And yet, it's the same thing. What's the difference? The difference comes, watch, watch what it comes from. The person who understands who they are in Christ, it will come across with authority. It'll just come across that way based on their understanding of who they are. The same, same another person saying the exact same things, word for word, it will not come across authoritatively because they don't know who they are, even though, even though they'll say the same thing. You understand? See, Jesus came across, and he was sharing things from the Word. And when he said it, it wasn't, it wasn't that he might have not, you know, there were, there, obviously he said things differently than what the Pharisees or the scribes said, but even when he said the same things, it came across with authority. Why? Because he knew who he was. They said, we never heard things like this before. This man does it with authority. Okay? The authority came through his relationship and who he knew he was. And it'll come with... See, this, what I'm trying to tell you is this is what you have. You have access to this. Your authority is going to be recognized as you have a relationship with your father and share that word with a confidence in his word. When you have that, then what you say will come across with authority. You understand what I'm saying? There isn't, any, there isn't any really more, it's not like trying to get more authoritative words. It's the same words. As long as it's God's word, it's, it, you understand what I'm saying? You're sharing God's word. It's not because you say it stronger or bolder. That's not the point. The point is you know who you are. When you know who you are 
and you share God's word, it will come across with authority. People will begin to recognize it in you. Okay? All right. Number four. God wanted man, this is what he wanted, in a position of fellowship and dominion so much. This is what God wanted. He wanted it so bad. <laughs> this is what he wanted that he was willing to sacrifice Jesus in order to get that. He wanted you to walk in that dominion and that fellowship with him so much that he was willing to sacrifice his son to get that back for you. You understand what redemption is? To redeem. When you redeem something, you purchase it back. You buy it back. Okay? That's what Jesus did. He redeemed us. In other words, here's where we were. When I say we, mankind, here's where we were. We were in fellowship with God, Adam, from the beginning. Understand? We lost that. Jesus came and did what? Redeemed it, restored it, gave it back to us. He gave us back that position, that position of authority, that position of glory, that, uh, that position of, uh, of dominion. Okay, number five. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Where's that? For, I don't think the scripture's in there. Where is that? Anybody know that scripture? 1 John 3. 1 John came to destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that, that he might come to destroy the works of the devil. I'll try to give as much as I know because Mary Beth's up there and she's Googling it right now. Trying to figure out where that scripture is. When she does and finds it, she'll put it up there. Okay? So the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did you find that yet? I thought it was 1 John 3. It might not be. I don't know. Three ten. Three eight. That's it. That's it. First John three eight. He who sins of the devil, the devil sinned from the beginning. This purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The word destroy is the is the word that means render it useless, render it without power. In other words, has no power, has no hold. The works of the devil. Uh, in other words, they're still there, but they have no power over you. That's what he did. To destroy it means he rendered them useless. Okay. All right. By his life, he showed us how to live on earth as man walking in dominion. That's what he did. Again, you, you, guys, you guys have been with me long enough. Okay. That you understand that when Jesus was on this earth, he was operating as a human being who was anointed by God. Okay? So you all know that. So I won't go into that because that's a little bit of a message there, but you, you get it. He was the second Adam. Jesus walked like a man without sin in a sinful world. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll start at verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Now watch, because it is worded a little bit different here. It's not exactly the way he said it. So I'm going to sh show you a little different, okay? According to the Word. According to the Word, okay? It doesn't say that he was the second... It does not say in the Word of God that Jesus was the second Adam. I want you to see that. 1 Corinthians 15, 45... And so it is written, the first man, everybody say first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became Jesus was not the second Adam, he was the last Adam. In other words, what Jesus did was bring an end to that nature. Okay, It wasn't an ongoing thing. He did not continue it through Adam. He, he brought an end to it. 
So he wasn't the second Adam, he was the last Adam. Okay? Now watch. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So Jesus was the last Adam, but he was the second man. Why was he the second man? Because mankind, he did not bring an end to mankind. He brought an end to the Adam nature. Does this make sense? He, but mankind continues. Jesus was the second man. So that now mankind keeps going because there's a third, fourth, fifth, and all the way, you know, all the way through to us and on. It just keeps going. But Adam ended. You understand what I'm saying? Adam ended, but man continued. In other words, the nature of man was brought to an end by Christ. He did away with the sin nature. So sin nature was ended, but man wasn't ended. Jesus brought an end to your sin nature. He did not bring an end to, 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 to man, human beings. You understand what I'm saying there? Okay. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have, past tense, born the image of the man of dust. That's the sin. The image of the man of dust was the sin. The fallen nature that we were born into. Okay? Because first was the natural. Our natural birth. Then comes the spiritual. Our spiritual birth. Okay? We, all, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So we begin with the image of the sin nature, but we, as we become born again, then we bear the image of the spiritual nature. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Because Jesus, as we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of our old, uh, our old nature, death and burial of old nature, resurrection of the new nature. Okay? Death and burial, we, 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 that's done away with. Done. Uh, um, old things in Christ have... Passed away. All things become new. Okay? Buried with the old, raised to the new. All right. That's what Jesus did for us. Okay? That's the truth. Truth six. Jesus did his part. He did his part. Somebody just come up to me. I don't forget who it was, Sunday morning. Somebody asked me about Jesus' words. You know, Jesus was on the cross. You remember what Jesus said? Do you know the last two things Jesus said on the cross? That's the last thing. There was two things he said. And understand this, okay? Because here's what somebody said. Did God forsake Jesus when he was on the cross? Well, I don't believe he did. I mean, this is a God who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, right? This is the God, okay. Then why did Jesus say, why have you forsaken me? There you go. Which one? This is one of my Bible students here. You can't get nothing past him. He never missed a class. Okay. Psalm number 22. Psalm number 22. Now, to understand, this is a little aside from today's lesson, but to understand when Jesus was on the cross, understand, I mean, Jesus is still teaching. Do you understand? He's on the cross suffering, and yet he is still teaching and prophesying to us. Just the thought of that. Just, so here he is, he's in his final moments. He knows he's about to, to, to pass away. He knows he's going to die. And he makes this statement. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, say, he makes this statement. And if you look at Psalm 22, verse 1, you find that he is directly quoting the first line. Directly quoting the first line of Psalm 22 when he says that. That's a quote. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, this is how I feel. He's saying, I'm quoting this scripture right now. I'm quoting from the Old Testament. Now, if you look at the very last verse of Psalm 22, which is verse 31, look at the very last verse, Psalm 22, verse 31, and look at the very last line that said, 
that he has done this. In the Hebrew, which is where that's from, that literally means it is finished. <coughs> so Jesus' last two phrases on the cross was the very first line of Psalm 22 and the very last line of Psalm 22, and then he died. And what does it mean? Well, to a Hebrew, they understand what it means. To a Hebrew, to quote, he was summing up the entire psalm by quoting the first and last line. He was basically saying, this is being fulfilled right now. Psalm 22 is a prophecy that was written by David about the suffering of the Messiah and the purpose of the Messiah coming to the earth. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was saying, this is being fulfilled right now at my death. Okay, you can look at that anyway. 31 verses in there, but that's what Jesus was doing. Okay, where am I at? Oh, Jesus did his part. He did his part, and it was finished. Turn to Romans chapter 5. How good was what Jesus did? How good was it? Okay. Jesus did his part. If we are not back into our original position before God, if we're not back there as a result of what Jesus did, then Jesus' sacrifice was not as good as Adam's sin was bad. Was the fall of man... Was that sin so bad that Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough to overcome that? That's the question. Romans 5, what verse? Did I give you that? 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded so much more. So, I mean, you could take, can you imagine that from, from Adam, from the first man, sin enters the world, and that sin grows. Can you imagine the extent of 4,000 years of sin? Can you imagine what that all entailed? I mean, we're talking Sodom and Gomorrah. We're talking some pretty ugly things that took place and compounded for 4,000 years, all laid upon one man in one, one moment of time to be completely wiped out by one act. The goodness and the perfection of Jesus to remove it in an instant. Can you imagine that? That's how good and how perfect his sacrifice was. To wipe out all of it. All of it. Not just 4,000 years of it. it. Even today. All the sin that we see in the world today. Which amazes me when people, when people look and say, we're living, we're, oh, nobody understands how bad it is now, and this is the worst of times, and I'm thinking, Couldn't, we haven't lived through a depression. Some of, some of us might have, but most of us haven't lived through a depression. We haven't lived through a major world war. Well, look at all the stuff that's going on with all the abortion and stuff. You should read that in the Bible where they sacrifice their kids, some nations. Well, all this sexual immorality. Hey, Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> that goes way back. So, no, it's not. There's no, man is man. Doesn't matter what time period you're, you're living in. It's still bad, you know what I'm saying? To say that we're living in the worst of times. We're not living in the worst of times, and let me tell you what. There are more believers on the earth right now today alive than there have ever been in the history of the world. Now, if there's more believers in the world today than there have ever been in the history of the world, guess what? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. There, there's a greater anointing on the earth today than there ever has been. There's way more anointing on the earth today than when Jesus walked on the earth. I can tell you that. Because he was only in one place at one time. There's anointed believers all over the world right now. Everywhere. Glory to God. Just this, this shining forth and getting brighter and brighter constantly. Okay. I'll get off that. Truth number seven. We 
being the body of Christ, are to walk as Jesus upon the earth. We know that. Being for others what Jesus was and is for us. We, everybody say that's me, we're to be deliverers. You know what the word deliverer is? You're like this. I'm going to bust your religious spirit right now. You're, the word deliverer means savior. Oh. Wow. Okay. That's us. We're to be deliverers. Don't call yourself a savior. That'll just mess people up. Just say, hey, I'm a deliverer. I'm a deliverer. It means the same thing, but I'm mad. That's why I tell people that don't wanna, they, don't, they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said, well, you, be, be, you believe in being filled with the Spirit? Oh, yeah, okay, then we'll just use that terminology. We won't mess you up too much. Okay. We're to be deliverers for those who are bound by Satan, as Jesus did. Jesus showed us how. By having fellowship and communion with our Heavenly Father and freely given what we have freely received. Freely have you, you've, you've received, right? How many have received salvation? Was it free? I mean, it cost Jesus' his life, but it was free for us, right? Okay. Freely we received, so what should we be doing with that? We should be giving that freely. Obadiah. There's a good book. How many's read that today? Or recently? Okay, Obadiah. It's not a long one. It's only one chapter. Obadiah. Okay, look at the last verse of Obadiah. There's only one chapter in it. Obadiah. What is it, verse number 21, I think? Yeah, verse number 21. Obadiah 21. The prophecy from the prophet of Obadiah. And watch, this is talking about us. Then, now look, is that word singular or plural? Saviors. Is Savior singular or plural? Plural word. That means more than one? Oh, okay. Saviors shall come to Mount Zion. Talk about the dwelling place of God. To judge the mountains of Esau. This is symbolic language. Esau representing sin. Okay? Or the flesh. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Okay, that's talking about you. That's, that goes along with kings and priests. Look at John 17, 18. John chapter 17, verse number 18. John 17, 18. Jesus is praying this prayer. And here's what he says. As you, talking about the Father, as you sent me in this world, meaning in the same manner, I sent them into the world. Talking about who? Talking about us or his disciples, specifically his disciples here. As you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Wow. In other words, you sent me to do this, I'm sending them to do the exact same thing. Okay? Okay, look at, uh, where's the other one at? John 20, 21. Again, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. How many is a disciple of Jesus? Yeah. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I send you. But what did, Jesus send, what did the Father send Jesus to do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel, preach the kingdom of God, right? He sent them to do the work, you know, those works. Spirit of God is upon me. Set people, that, set people that are bondage free, okay? Set them at liberty. That's what he sent Jesus to do. Well, if he sent Jesus to do it, Jesus said, that's what I'm sending you to do. I'm sending you to do the same thing the Father sent me to do. Now, Jesus said, I was confined to one nation, one small area. But you do the same thing I did, but don't just do it here. Do it, in, do it here in Jerusalem, do it in Judea, do it in Samaria, and do it to the uttermost parts of the world. Go into all the world and do what you witness me do. It's not that hard, is it? It's not that difficult. I mean, that's what he's saying, right? I don't know how you argue with that. Okay. What are examples of dominion given to man? What, what does that mean? What are examples of dominion given to man? Well, here it is. Freedom to heal anyone. That's part of our dominion. Part of our dominion is to go lay hands on the sick. See them get better. That's part of our dominion. 
We should, we should, if you have dominion, now watch, here's, here's again. If you have dominion over the enemy, right? How many believe you got dominion over the enemy? How many believe a sickness is a result of the enemy? If you have dominion over the enemy, then you got dominion over sickness. Is that correct? Okay. Is sickness a work of the enemy? Okay. Did Jesus destroy that? Okay. Did he give you the power? Did he give you the authority? Okay. Are we, did he do it? Did he do that when he was on the earth? Was that part of his assignment? And we're supposed to be doing the same thing he did, right? So this is something we should be expecting. If it's not happening in our lives, why isn't it happening? That, we'll get into that, I think, next week. But, but these are things, see, these things should be happening. We ought to be experiencing it. We ought to be seeing it. And if we're not seeing it, something's wrong. And it's not God. It's not His Word. And it's not because we don't have the power. Because we already, you know, we can already see we got that. We already got, it's not because we don't have the authority. We're just not walking in it. And there's, there's probably reasons. And here's the whole thing. And we're just going to come down to it. Probably next week. But it's going to come down to this. It's going to come down to you do not need to make major changes in your life. There's probably just a couple small things, just a few little things, a few little ideas, a little thing, just something simple that needs tweaked a little bit. You know, when something, when, when you look at somebody that, that's, or, you know, that's off just a little bit, it's not like you have to just revamp everything. It's just something minor usually. And for most believers, that's all it is. It's not like major changes in your life that have to, you know, some of you might be, but most, most people it's not. Most people that really love God and it just aren't seeing results. It's just something, it's not, it's, it's probably something very simple. And that's what we'll find out. You'll discover that. What is it? It's probably not anything major, just something simple. Just something simple. Usually it's just, for, and for most people, let me tell you, for most people it's going to be just a little change in the way you think. Just a little adjustment of the mind. Not majorly, just a little bit. Just, just tweak that adjustment of a, of a mindset, something that you're thinking just has to be turned just a little bit, just changed. Nothing major, just a little bit. Get that thing changed a little bit and you're going to see tremendous results. Tremendous results. Okay? So you have an example of dominion given to man is freedom to heal anyone. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, verse 7. As you go, preach. Preach. And say the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devil. Freely you receive, freely give. That's your mandate. Luke 9, verse 1. He called his 12 disciples, gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, sent them to do what? Preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Luke 9. Verse 4, whatsoever house that you enter into, abide there and then depart. Whoever will not receive you when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And, and they departed and they went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I just see that it's connected. Luke 10, 8. Into whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, heal the sick that are there, say to them, the kingdom of God is coming upon you. Look at uh, Romans 15. This is what Paul said. Romans chapter 15. Verse 18. Romans 15, verse 18. Paul says this, I will not dare to speak of any of those things that Christ has not accomplished through me. So I'm not going to say what he didn't do. I'm going to tell you what he did. What Christ has accomplished through me in word, Paul was a preacher, 
Okay? Paul says he accomplishes through me in word and deed. Word and deed. What did Jesus tell the disciples to do? Preach the gospel and heal the sick. Okay? That's the deed. To make the Gentiles obedient. In what? In mighty... Verse 19. Signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, so from these places that Paul visited, he said this, I have, now watch this, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. That's what Paul said. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Because let me tell you something. Those who are preaching in word only are not fully preaching the gospel. Any minister, any ministries that are preaching the word without any deeds, they're not fully preaching the gospel. Anyone who is sharing the word of God, the gospel, the good news, but not seeing signs, not seeing wonders, not seeing any miracles, not seeing any results, you are not fully preaching the gospel. In order to fully preach the gospel, it must be accompanied by signs. There must be results. If there's no results, it's not, a, it's not fully preaching it. It's like partially preaching it. You understand? There has to be, there has to be results. If there's not results, if there's not miracles, if there's not signs and wonders, that's not fully preached. That's not, that's not the full gospel. The full gospel has to have signs and wonders. It has to have it. It has to be, it should be expected. As a believer, you need to be expecting that. You need to be expecting that. When you're sharing the word of God with people, you need to be expecting results. Okay? Expecting results. You should be sharing with them. They should be getting convicted. They should be getting healed. Okay? I'm not saying 100% of everybody, because a lot of people will reject it, but you should be, as you're sharing... You need this, even people that are rejecting it, it's still a sign of wonder to them too. But it, the point is, as you're sharing, you should be expecting results. You should be expecting salvations and healings and deliverance. You should be expecting those things because that's what the Word of God, that's the, that's the true, that's the full gospel. And it's all through. I mean, Jesus, Jesus gave that to his disciples, his 12, his 70, to all the believers. Okay, Paul preached it. It was, it's just, it's what's expected. We see it all through the word. It's what's expected. Jesus said it. Okay. We should have examples of dominion given to man. B, freedom to pray for anything within the parameters of a Christian life. In other words, whatever you know to be the word of God within a believer's life, you have the power and authority to pray that. You understand what I'm saying? You know the will of God for somebody. You know it's God's will for them to be strong and healthy. That's God's will. Healed. Okay, we know that. You know it's God's will for people to be successful. It's God's will for people to be courageous. It's God's will for people not to be lazy. You understand that? So you, you can pray, lining up with the things of God's word. Okay? It's God's will. In Christian parameters, somebody comes to you and says, hey, would you pray... Would you pray, you know, that I, that I marry this particular person? Well, yeah, I'll pray for the will of God because I'm not sure about that. If it's same sex, hey, no, I can't pray that. I won't pray that. Why? That doesn't fall in the parameters of the Word of God. <laughs> Understand? So no, we can't pray for that. In fact, we're going to do exactly the opposite. I'm going to pray against that. You understand? When we understand what God's will is specifically for people, according to the word, we can pray exactly that. And we have the power and authority to pray those kinds of prayers that line up with God's word according to, according to what that says. Okay, so that's the keys of the kingdom. All right, hallelujah. <laughs> Freedom to say what you want and get it. What does that mean exactly? Freedom to say... Now, this is given to who? Believers. You have freedom to say what you want. If you're a true believer, then what do you want? You want God's will, okay? You want God's will. 
So your prayers are lined up according to the will of God. Therefore, the desires of your heart are already submitted unto His desires. Okay, It's not just asking God for selfish things and then believing to get them. And it's not wrong to ask for things. But it's, it's, it's God's looking at your heart. What's your main desire? What's the main thing you want? You know, I've heard, people, I've heard people say, well, I don't want nothing. You know, I don't really want anything. I don't really, I just want to get by. I don't need any extra. You know, Tim and I look at them and say, how selfish. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm just being humble. I say, no, you're being selfish. That's a selfish believer that says, I just want enough just to get by. So you don't want to share with somebody. You don't want to help any other, you know, you don't want to sow into somebody else, help somebody else out. Not just, just enough to get by for me. That's selfish. Because God is a God of excess and abundance. He says, I'm a God to give you more than enough. Why? So that you can take what you have freely received and freely give it. So that you can be generous. I love the scripture, you know, that says that God has enriched you in all things. So that you can be generous on every occasion. And that generosity brings glory to God. Being generous brings glory to God. How can, how can you be generous if you're just squeaking by in life? That's, again, that's riding the cattle car when you could be in first class. Okay? Jesus has called us to have abundance. But he's also called us to be a good steward. It's not being wasteful or, and things like that, okay? It's not being selfish. It's being generous. It's being, learning to be a giver. Amen? That's why he gives you gifts. That's why do you think, why do you think he gives you revelation of stuff? Just for you? Because you're going to come in contact with people that's going to need to know that wisdom. They're going to need that, they're going to need that understanding that God's given you that. How, are you, how do you think you're going to get more wisdom? Because you're going to share the wisdom you got. You just take the wisdom and keep it for yourself. The revelation of God's word, just share, keep it for yourself. That doesn't even make sense, does it? Why would he give you any more? He's giving it to you so that you can share it with others. That's why he gives it to you. That's what we want to get. We want, we want to get so much of God that we, you know, when you get so full... You can't keep it. It has to come out. You get so full. You know, you know that peace and joy, you know that those things are contagious? You know you get around peaceful people, you start feeling at peace. Did you ever notice you get around irritable people, you start getting irritable? <laughs> Did you ever notice that? You get around people that are anxious all the time and confused all the time, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Jeez, oh man, you, you just, you, it's contagious, okay? But you get around, see, so is joy, so is peace, so is the presence of God. It's contagious. And, the, and see, what you want to do is you want to get to where when you get around those kind of people, the presence of God is greater in you than the enemy is greater than them. Because that's the truth. Greater is he who's in me, right? than he was in the world. We don't have to give in to that. We don't have to take on. You see, it's contagious, but you don't have to take it. It's contagious if you'll take it, but you don't have to take it. Because you're serving the greater, you're, you're, you're in the greater authority. You're walking in the greater power. Okay? And how's that happen? You, you just know it. When you know it, you're able to do it. Amen? All right. Praise God. So we ask, we get what we say. Why? Because we're asking it in, in the Word of God. That's what, like prayer. That's why I preach Sunday morning. All right, hallelujah. So I'll end there so that we can start next week on this. But I'll give you this ahead of time. So this is what we've been doing lately is uh, you guys read ahead. Then we go over it. That way you're, you come in prepared. All right? You come in already prepared. So this is... Is that what it is? 
Some of them are missing 36. Oh, all right. So I didn't get to that yet. Yeah. I thought I was passing out 36 and 37. I... I got to talk a little faster next week, I guess. All right. Hallelujah. So, chapter 8 next week. All right, so Heavenly Father, we thank You and we praise You that we have an understanding of who we are in You. And we know according to the Word what You've called us to do and who You've called us to be and who you called us to be like. And Lord, we go expecting results so that we, we are fully preaching Your Word. And we give You praise for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.